Okay, time to get going. Everyone have a good long weekend. I think it was, it, that was our last long weekend for the rest of the semester, right? We got the one for the move out date and then this one, but it's gonna be a long haul without fall break until the end of the semester. But we'll get through it. So let's see here. I put up the warm up question. Let me explain that and then I'll go through some announcements and I'll give you a little bit more time to finish up the warm up. So this is also for lesson two. In the lesson two homework, there are three types of math problems. We have two Kepler third, you know, Kepler's third law problems. And we spent a lot of time talking about how to do those and, and working examples in lecture and also with these warm up questions. And then you have two parallax questions in the homework. I think one is Earth baseline, one is stellar parallax, which is Earth orbit baseline. And that's what our practice problem is today. Also in the homework one, you're given the distance and asked to solve for the angular shift. One, you're given the angular shift and asked to solve for the distance. And this would be an example of one of those things today as well. So I, I worked out an example in class last time. We calculated the distance to Venus at closest approach using parallax. Uh, and that was Earth baseline parallax where you were given the angular shift. So I think this one is the opposite on both accounts, stellar parallax where you're given the distance. Anyway, some practice, and then you'll have more practice in the homework, and that should get you ready for the exam. These tend to be one of the trickier um, types of problems because there's usually two components, like a plug and chug component, but also a unit conversion component that's important. But anyway, in this one, we're talking about a nearby star. That star, I tell you, is one million astronomical units away, uh, which, is, which would be a, a nearby star. Uh, stars get much, much farther away than that. And I'm asking through how many arc seconds does this, a star, does this star appear to move as Earth moves from this side of the orbit to the other side of the orbit, which as I've drawn it happens to be January to July. So that's that. And I'll give you time in a second. Let me just run through some other announcements. I just want to set that up so you can start thinking about it in the background. Uh, homework two is due this Friday and we will wrap up homework two today so that holds. And I'll have office hours tomorrow at the regular time. So if you're having any difficulty with the math questions then, or any questions, feel free to come to office hours. Homework three was due the following Friday. I've already bumped it to the Monday after that. And then, um, was it four days later, the Friday after that is the first exam. And that's, that's still the date we'll go with for now. We'll see uh, how well we do getting through the lesson three material, which we'll start today. Also, uh, one other announcement before getting back to the warm up question is today, if you're in the lab courses, in the lab sections, I sent you an email, and you may have already gotten some information from your, your TA. Um, you know, the reason we have these labs where you get to use real telescopes at real observatories that are also use, used by real professionals, you know, this is obviously not something done on the cheap. It's uh, a pricey enterprise, and I'm excited that we can open it to students. So the way we do that is through getting grants from the National Science Foundation, in particular the National Science Foundation Education Directorate. Uh, they're the ones who are funding large efforts uh, so we can open up these telescopes for student use. And uh, we just got another one of those grants, as I think I mentioned before, a large one, almost two million bucks. And as part of that, we have to survey our students. And so I've sent you out a, a pre-post survey, which means this is the pre, and then you'll see the exact same survey at the end of the semester. It's very straightforward, simple questions about your attitudes, about astronomy, and about science in general, and questions about how confident you feel, uh, how confident you are in your own abilities to do different things. And it's all anonymous. I'll never see the answers except in aggregate form. I won't see your individual names or anything attached to anything. Uh, but I would appreciate it if you did the survey. I can't make you do it, 
Uh, it's a, you know, it's an IRB approved internal review board approved type thing. So it's optional, but um, it's really important for me to get a high return rate. It's only 10 to 15 minutes. And again, they're pretty straightforward questions. It may actually even be somewhat interesting to do. So please, if you can find the time, that helps us to continue to raise money to make the telescopes available to students in you know, formats similar to how you're accessing them. Okay. So that's that. Are there any other questions before I get back to the warm up? Okay. Back to the warm up. I see we have eight responses so far, and it's probably because you're listening to me chit chat and you can't concentrate. So I'm going to be quiet the next 30, 40, 50 seconds and give you a chance to work your way through this problem. Looks like I have about 50 of you. So I'm expecting about 20 responses. I'll, I'll throw you in the, in the break rooms. It's me cracking the whip. Whoosh. Give you another 20 seconds. All right, 20, I'll take it. I know some of you are still in the process of working your way through it. These math ones are tricky, particularly this, the two-step one. Feel free to keep submitting. Don't feel bad if you didn't get it done at this pace. But uh, let's just see what we have so far. Got some numbers all over the place. Let's do a histogram. Yeah, and so when I add enough bins, the correct answer is here, uh, 0 0.41 arc seconds. I'd say a plurality got it right, not a majority. But uh, let me go through it, go through the steps here. Because again, these are, these are some of the trickier calculations you'll be expected to do. But once you've had a little bit of practice, both here and in the homeworks, you should be ready to do this for the exam. Let me uh, put up the dot cam here. Make it easy for you to see. Okay, so here's the equation, and we derived that equation last time. Theta is the angular shift, distance is the distance away, and baseline is the distance between the observing points. 
And so I won't rederive this, and you don't have to rederive it from scratch, but you need to be able to grab this equation and use it. Now, almost always I'm going to give you either theta and ask for distance, or I give you distance and ask for theta, the angular shift, one or the other. The baseline will always either be Earth diameter, if we're doing Earth baseline parallax, or the diameter of Earth's orbit if we're doing stellar parallax. So you should be able to infer that from the problem. If it's Earth diameter um, parallax, I'll give you Earth's diameter. I don't expect you to remember that. But if it's stellar parallax, like in this particular question, what is the baseline? In astronomical units, how many astronomical units is the baseline? Two, that's right, two astronomical units. And I won't give you the baseline for stellar parallax. I expect you to know that. Again, the radius of the orbit is one AU, so the diameter is two AU. Okay. Now also in the math notes, I have two pre-solved versions. I have one where it's already solved for theta and one where it's already solved for distance. Uh, I think what I'm doing here is I'm just plugging things in and I'll solve after the fact, but those pre-solved versions may be useful, may be cleaner. And so just be aware that they're there. Okay, so two AU going in for the baseline and the distance was a million. So that's down here in the denominator. The AUs will cancel out. So two divided by two pi times 10 to the six. And this is a cause of a lot of calculator errors. You wanna divide by two, divide by pi, divide by 10 to the six. Uh, don't divide by two pi 10 to the six because your calculator may divide by two and then multiply by these numbers. Or put the, all these numbers in the denominator in parentheses. Anyway, two divided by all this stuff will be a very small number. Uh, three times 10 to the minus seven. And then to get theta by itself, we're gonna multiply both sides by 360 degrees. That brings this up to about 10 to the minus four degrees. So again, it's a very small angular shift. And astronomers, they tend to measure things in arc seconds. So this is the unit conversion. We're gonna to wanna to go from degrees to arc seconds. One degree, there are 60 arc minutes. In one arc minute, there's 60 arc seconds, and you multiply this all out, degrees cancel with degrees, arc minutes with arc minutes, you're left with an answer in arc seconds, and it's 0 0.4, 0 0.413 arc seconds. Yep, that's the whole thing. And that's what most of you got. Well, it's what a plurality of you got, but hopefully that helps, and you'll, you know, you'll have better luck or, or do well with the ones in the homework. Okay, questions about that? Okay, so let me slide this over. Where are we? We're at the end of lesson two. Lesson two is planetary motion. And uh, we had gotten up to Kepler's laws and then Newton's laws of motion. So with Kepler's laws, he's describing the motions of the planets and he's nailed it. He's finally gotten it right. We finally, after all these centuries, got it right. We can explain the motions of the planets, predict where they'll be in the sky to as much accuracy as we want. So then we start talking about Newton's laws of motion and the, why are we doing this? It's because Kepler's laws are empirical. They're mathematical equations that work, but Newton suspected there's a deeper, more fundamental level of understanding. So he's introducing these physical laws uh, of motion. And so far we've just talked about, uh, we haven't talked about gravity or anything in space. We've just talked about balls rolling on tables and things of that nature, just basic motion down here on earth. But what we're gonna do now is take his laws of motion and build up and create his law of gravity. And then once we have his law of gravity, we'll be able to use it to explain Kepler's laws. That's, that's the flow that we're gonna to try to achieve. Okay, so next topic's Newton's, let me write it out here, Newton's universal law of gravity. The universal law is kind of a big deal. This is a law that works not just here on Earth, but throughout the entire universe, which was a new and novel concept back at that time in history. We thought there are certain laws that governed the universe 
down or govern things on earth and separate rules for the heavens above. And we thought they were completely separate. Uh, and Newton, in coming up with this law of gravity, stumbles upon the idea that it's just one set of laws that describes everything. We take that for granted now, but it was really kind of insightful then. But it, we'll double back onto that concept. Let's build up his universal law of gravitation. We'll start with this example, the baseball player. Well, let me just expand it a little bit and keep some of my whiteboard. Okay, good enough anyway. So here we have a baseball player throwing a baseball. And this is actually demonstrating all three of Newton's laws of motion, N1, N2, and N3. We'll start to put these together. So N1, if you recall, a body at rest will stay at rest. A body in motion in a straight line at a constant speed will stay in that motion unless acted upon by a force. So the baseball player releasing the baseball is an example of Newton's first law. Throwing it in a particular direction at a particular speed, in the absence of forces, it would just keep moving in that direction at that speed for all time. But there are forces acting on it. There's air friction, which is slowing it down. But more importantly, the force of gravity. You know, it has two components. It has a forward component and an up-down component to its motion. The forward speed stays pretty constant the whole time, except maybe air friction slowing it down. But the up-down speed changes a lot. It immediately starts to slow down because there's the force of gravity acting on it, eventually halts its motion and brings it back down to Earth. So this is where we bring in Newton's second law. Oops, that's a three. <laughs> Newton's second law, force is mass times acceleration. So let's spell it out. The force of the Earth acting on that baseball is equal to the mass of the baseball times the acceleration of the baseball. Let me slide this back a little bit. Okay, that's Newton's second law, showing how force, mass, and acceleration are related. And then by Newton's third law, we know that there is an equal and opposite force, the force, the baseball acting on the Earth. And again, by his law, these are equal. We always think about Earth pulling on objects such as the baseball, but we never think about the baseball pulling on Earth. And by Newton's third law, it's the same force that, that the baseball exert, exerts on the Earth as the Earth exerts on the baseball. Again, this seems strange, but think back to the, the car crash example we did last time. It was the same force. The difference is the acceleration. And it's a big difference because of the difference in mass. So the force of the baseball acting on the Earth would be the mass of the Earth times the acceleration of the Earth. And these forces are the same by Newton's third law, just in opposite directions. And if you take that force and divide by the low mass of the baseball, you get a big acceleration. If you divide by the huge mass of the Earth, you get a teeny tiny acceleration. And that's why we can always ignore Earth chasing, you know, behind this baseball. Okay. So let's uh, summarize a few things. From this, we know that this force, we can just, we don't need the subscripts because it's the same force. We know the force is proportional to the mass of the baseball from the first one. We also know that force is proportional to the mass of the Earth from this one. So we can put those together. The force is going to be proportional to the product. Proportional to one, proportional to the other. Of course, it's also proportional to these acceleration terms, but we'll come up with a, an expression for that separately. If we want to write it even more generally, the force between two objects is proportional to the mass of the first object times the mass of the second object. And in most cases, we just consider, we don't think about the mass of the second object, uh, like us standing here on Earth or the baseball being thrown over Earth. But if you go out, you can find astronomical examples where the masses are comparable. You can find binary stars where the two stars have similar masses. So clearly, it's going to depend on the mass of both, not just one. And it has to do it in kind of a, an equivalent way. So this is not too surprising. That this is what he's come up with. But that's not the whole story. There's one other factor that's really important 
with the force and what is that factor, that parameter that matters? Someone want to shout it out? Distance. Distance, yeah. Scrolling my slides down. Yep, the distance. And this is a hard one, or it was a hard one for Newton to test. If you want to take an empirical approach, an experimental approach, you can measure the force, basically measure how much something weighs here on the ground, and then you have to get up to a greater distance and measure again and see how much less it is. And then another and another, and once you have that data, you can figure out how force drops off with distance, how it changes with distance. But Newton couldn't do that. It's, it's not the distance from the surface that matters, it's the, it's the distance from the center of the earth. He could climb a tree, go to the top of a building, but you're still essentially the same distance from the center of the earth. He couldn't get farther away from the center of the earth enough uh, to make a, a substantive, substantive, yeah, there we go, uh, measurement. So he, he took a Gedanken approach. He did a Gedanken experiment. That's, a, that's German for thought experiment. So here it is, Newton's canon. And then he combined it, as you'll see, with planetary data to, to finish it up. So he's thinking, and this is from the Principia, this figure. Newton drew it himself. You have the Earth there, and suppose you have a really tall mountain. No mountain is actually that tall compared to Earth, but just you know, pretend it's a thought experiment. And you drag a cannon. This is called Newton's cannon. So you drag a cannon up to the top of the mountain and fire the cannonball with a certain force, a certain speed. And it goes and lands here at the bottom of the mountain. Well, if you fire it with more speed, it'll go farther, obviously, and it'll land somewhere out here. And even more, it'll go and go and go, and the Earth is curving beneath it, but it will eventually land here. In this case, we've gone one quarter of the way around the Earth. And you fire with more force, it's going to keep going and falling and falling and falling, but the ground is falling beneath it, and so it lands over here. And then with enough force, it'll keep falling and falling and falling and falling, and the ground is falling at the same rate, and you keep falling, you come back to right where you started, and then just keep going. If there's no air friction, you just keep going around and around and around forever. Of course, there is air friction, so you know that's not going to work, unless this mountain so tall it gets above the atmosphere, uh, and in which case this is an orbit that's like a satellite going around the Earth. You can imagine uh, maybe he builds a tower and, and brings his cannon all the way up here and fires. And, and so that's like a, a higher orbit. And you can imagine keep going all the way up to the, the orbit of the moon. So the moon is basically a big cannonball in this analogy. It's moving at just the right speed that it's falling at just the right rate that it keeps going back to where it started. And this was the great aha moment because now you have descriptions, laws that work on earth, laws of motion laws of gravity that work here on Earth that are explaining the motions of things up in space, such as the moon and satellites. Newton didn't have satellites back in his day, but not artificial ones, but the same principle applies. And so he realized, wow, I can figure stuff out down here on the Earth, either in my head or us lesser beings have to do experiments to figure out the, the laws of nature, figure it out down here on Earth, in our laboratories, get these laws, and they're universal. They work throughout the entire universe, throughout all of space. And so that's a big leap, but it's a powerful one, because we can just fiddle around in our labs here, come up with laws, and then use them to explain everything in the universe. And um, we've tested this, you know, it, it is a huge leap, but how far have we tested it? Well, we've sent spacecraft out of the solar system, the two Voyager probes have left the, sol <coughs> left the solar system. We have New Horizons, which visited Pluto and is now some distance beyond it. So we have some probes that have gone pretty far out and they continue to function under the laws that we assume when we designed them. And um, we haven't gotten farther out than that, but we can look as far out as we want and we see things going on in the universe, things happening. And, in objects in different states. And we can take the light and take a spectrum of the light. And as we'll learn in lesson three, there's all sorts of physical information that we can extract from the spectrum of light. And so far, everything we see is explainable 
with the laws of nature. It all fits together with these laws that we've derived here on Earth. So the laws of nature do appear to be universal. So again, we talked about empirical law, such as Kepler's laws. We talked about physical law, such as Newton's, where you have a deeper level of understanding. And now we're talking about universal law. And you can have, you know, they can pair up. Newton's laws are both physical laws and universal laws. Okay, powerful concept. So then when he realizes that the things in the heavens are following the same laws of gravity as everything down here on Earth, then he can just look at planets at different distances from the sun, look at their distances and speeds and forces, and um, then figure out how the force of gravity varies with distance from the sun. Because he now realize, you know, they're just not moving at any particular God-given speeds. They're just following the law of gravity. Okay, so how does this work? Well, here's the Earth going around the sun. And uh, we're traveling right now at some speed in some direction. That's the red arrow. But the force of gravity is always pulling on us, always deflecting our orbit. And so we have this instantaneous speed, but the force is just such that it keeps pulling us into an orbit that circles around and comes back on itself, uh, pretty close to a circle. Um, now, if we were going faster, you can imagine you need a stronger force to hold us in that circular orbit. We'd want to fly off into space. Or if we were going slower, uh, you'd need a lesser force to keep us in this orbit. So clearly the speed at which you're traveling and the force that's required to keep you in that orbit, they're related. So let's uh, write that over here. The force is related to the speed. The faster the speed, the the higher the force has to be to keep you in that orbit. And then what we'll do is we'll look at the planets going around the sun and see how their speeds connect to their distances from the sun. And then through transitivity, we'll have a relationship between force and distance, which is the part of Newton's law of gravity we still need. But first, just to demonstrate, I'll do a little demo here, that force and velocity are related. This is something you can derive and I'm going to give you a video to watch where we derive this and a few other things in just a minute. Let me just do a quick demo. So here I have a ball on a string. Uh, the force of gravity between the ball and me is too weak, so I, I can't use gravity, but the string will carry the force through the tension in the string. So I'll wrap it around my finger, and maybe I'll give it a little bit more space. Not in my classroom, so I've got to be careful not to hit the ceiling or anything. So I'm spinning it at a certain speed, and you know, so there's a force, the tension in the string, and I feel it in my finger. And so my finger's like a measuring device for the force, a free one. Now if I increase the speed, then I can feel it in my finger. It's a much greater force to keep it in the circular orbit. My finger is it's turning blue because the string is cutting off the blood supply. And you all can imagine the same thing if you have a ball on a string and you're spinning it, force and speed are related. And as I said, you can derive an expression for this and uh, we will in an upcoming video. So force and velocity are related in the same direction. Now for objects going around the sun, the fast moving ones are the closest in. You know, we can measure how fast the plants go. Uh, Mercury is really close to the sun. Actually, this is the next plot. Uh, ignore this for a second. I'll just describe in words. Uh, Mercury is the fastest moving one and it's close to the sun. Neptune, the farthest planet out there, is the slowest. It's farthest. So these things are oppositely related. Let me get that here. The faster you're going, that means you're closer to the sun. That's the relationship there. So by transitivity, we know that the closer things to the sun will have a greater force of gravity to keep them in their orbit. And that's what I'm plotting up here. So this is force versus distance. The force is in arbitrary units, units of Mercury's force. So here's Mercury. Venus is almost twice as far away and it's one quarter the force, turns out. Now Earth is almost three times as way, three times farther away, one ninth the force. Mars four times, one sixteenth. 
So this is a one over distance squared relationship. And that's the part that we needed. The force of gravity is proportional to one over the distance squared. So it's half a thought experiment and, and half planetary data. And the thought experiment let Newton know that he could use the planetary data to figure this out because it was a universal law. He can use stuff in the heavens to explain laws here down on earth and vice versa. So let's combine these two. We know mass or force is proportional to the product of masses. It's inversely proportional to square the distance. So altogether, force is proportional to m1, m2 over distance squared. And this is Newton's universal law of gravitation. Here it is in words. Uh, every particle of matter in the universe attracts every other particle of matter uh, with a force that's directly proportional. That means in the numerator, the product of the masses of the particles. And inversely, that means in the denominator, proportional to the square of the distance between their centers. These things are always scarier to look at in words. The equation seems to do it better justice. Here it is again. And proportional means there's a constant proportionality. So we call that G for gravity. Here we have two masses, a distance R between each other. This is the force between them. G, I'll write it out, but you're not really going to need it. G is equal to, uh, let's have it here, but 6.67 times 10 to the minus 11 Newton meter squared per kilogram squared. Those are the units. And you won't need it because I'm not going to ask you to calculate any forces in Newtons. I will give you ratio questions. Like, uh, let's just try some. Let's see how good you're getting at this ratio stuff. Uh, I said that once you wrap your mind around it, you'll be able to just look at the equation and know the answer. So let's say it's the sun and the earth. What if the sun doubled its mass magically uh, right now? The force between the sun and the earth would go up by a factor of two. That's right. And uh, what if we doubled the distance between the sun and the earth right now magically? The force of gravity would go down by a factor of four. That's right, because it's two squared. So again, you can just look at the equation and get the answers. Now, the last question in the homework, I do a combination of these. I increase one of the masses and the distance, and, but you can work through it using this ratio approach. Okay, so we have Newton's law of gravity. So the final step is to tie this back to Kepler's laws of motion, which we know are mathematically correct. But if we can derive Kepler's laws from Newton's laws of motion and Newton's laws of, uh, law of gravity, then we've explained what's going on. And also remember with Kepler's law, he hasn't explained his constant proportionality. Get to that in a second. Let me go back to the dog cam here. Remember Kepler's law is, Kepler's third law anyway, is P squared is proportional to A cubed. And the constant proportionality differs for every central object. He hasn't explained that yet. And, and he doesn't really explain why the orbits are elliptical, why planets sweep out equal areas in equal times. These are his laws, but using Newton's laws, we hope to explain that. Now, to do this, you know, just think about the situation here. You have two masses out in space, some distance between them. You give them initial velocities in different directions. What will their motion be, given the force between them? And Newton sat down to try to figure this out, and he said, I need calculus to do this. And uh, there was no calculus, so he took a break from inventing physics and invented calculus, and then came back and used it. Newton's just one of these amazing scientific figures. There are a lot of scientists that are clever. Like Kepler was kef uh, clever. Galileo was clever. But there's some who are just incredibly, scarily, wickedly smart, and Newton's one of them just inventing entire fields to solve problems. You know, modern civilization is based in large part on physics, on mathematics, calculus in particular. Uh, the engineers need to know all of this stuff. Even if you're designing circuit boards and things like this, it's calculus, it's physics. And it, it all, or a good chunk of it goes right back to Newton here. 
Uh, Einstein was also that, that smart. Um, I'd also put Richard Feynman in that category. It's a name you may not know, but he came up with his own version of quantum mechanics. It was better than the original one and that they built new versions of quantum mechanics based on. Uh, those three are probably the smartest, most insightful scientists of the, at least of the modern era, if you want to include Newton in the modern era. Anyway, so he invented calculus. Leibniz also invented calculus, just for the record, and they did simultaneously. And then they spent years arguing with each other about who deserved credit. At one point, Leibniz petitioned the Royal Astronomical Society to decide this matter, which wasn't a smart move since Newton chaired the Royal Astronomical Society and just decided in his own favor. But uh, anyway, uh, Leibniz also gives credit for calculus. So once Newton had calculus, he can figure out, okay, what will the resultant motion be? Turns out ellipses, they'll travel in ellipses. You can derive it from first principles, from Newton's laws. Um, what about the speed? Well, it moves faster when you're close to the central body, slower when you're farther away. And if you work through it, it's exactly as Kepler described, sweeping out equal areas and equal times. So he was able to derive these things. And finally, uh, the third law, P squared is proportional to A cubed. He was able to derive that as well. And he was able to derive the constant of proportionality. I'll write that here. So P squared is equal to four pi squared over g times the sum of the masses times a cubed. So this is the constant proportionality. It depends on both big M, which is the mass of the central object, and little m, which is the mass of the orbiting object. Now, for most things in the solar system, you can ignore the orbiting object. The, the mass of the planets is nothing compared to the mass of the sun. The mass of most moons are nothing compared to the mass of their central planet. There are a few exceptions, but most of the time you can ignore the little mass. So P squared is approximately equal to four pi squared over GM. So dependent on the mass of the central body. That explains why we have a different constant proportionality for each central body, for the sun, for Jupiter, for Earth. Kepler didn't know why, but Newton was able to explain it. Oops, A cubed P squared. Okay. So I'm not going to do it in class today. Sometimes I do. Instead, I'm going to assign it as a video, but I derive Kepler's third law from Newton's for a special case. This, this class doesn't use any calculus, and I just said to do this, you need calculus. But if we make two simplifying assumptions, you can actually derive Kepler's third law from Newton's laws of gravity and motion. So here are the two assumptions. One, we're going to assume the orbit is circular. circular orbit, in which case the semi-major axis just becomes what? The orbit circular, the semi-major axis is the what of the circle? Radius. Radius, Radius yep. And the second simplifying assumption is we're going to assume the central mass is much greater than the orbiting mass. In other words, we can ignore the, the orbiting object also tugging on the central object. If you make these two simplifying assumptions, you don't need calculus. You just need high school algebra one. And I'm not going to take up class time since we're running behind, but I do want you to watch that video. I've already put it on the YouTube site in the lesson two folder, and it, it will be at the very end. And, you know, I'll put this video here in a few hours, and then you can watch that one. It's about 20 minutes, though the first five minutes is what I've just done. So you can skip ahead of the intro and watch the derivation. I'm not going to hold you responsible. You're not going to have to reproduce this derivation. But sometimes it's good to see that these things can be done and that you'll be able to follow each step given what you've learned and see that Kepler's laws can indeed be derived from Newton's. So physical law rules the day now instead of empirical law. Okay, that brings us to the end of lesson two. I'll pause for a second for any quick questions before st starting setting up lesson three. Yeah, can okay. you put, put up the uh, explanation for the warm-up question again? Yeah, I'll put it up and how about, uh, unless you have, a, you have a question? No, I just, just want to see it. I just want to see it real quick. Thank you. Sure. Did a screen capture? Okay. All right, lesson three. So in lessons one and two, 
we did some astronomy, right? We basic astronomy, the earth, the sun, the moon, the sphere of stars, uh, or actual stars out there in 3D space. Uh, in lesson two, we threw in the planets from a historical point of view. As we worked our way through, we eventually got to physics with Newton there at the end. We're gonna, we're gonna put the planets, we're gonna put astronomy aside for a little bit and continue our, our exploration of physics, both in lesson three and in lesson four, we'll talk about uh, the instruments, telescopes that we use to collect the data. But lesson three in particular, we're gonna be talking about the nature of light. Maybe, let me get a fresh page here. Lesson three, light. And the reason for this is once we understand light really well, it will open up all sorts of physical information. You know, you think of an astronomer, astronomer takes their telescope, points at an object, collects the light, makes a pretty picture. And we can learn some things from the pictures, like this is a spiral galaxy. No, this is an elliptical galaxy. Or, this star is red, and this one's blue. But it's kind of like the difference between an astronomer and an astrophysicist. Astronomers take pictures. They generally don't get paid. They're amateurs. And then you have astrophysicists, and, such as myself, and our job is to figure out what's going on in the universe. Our job isn't to take pictures. We may do that, but it's to figure out what's going on. And the, usually the best way is not through taking a picture, but by taking the light and dispersing it into its component colors, uh, such as you see here. And using a prism or other devices, gratings, things that we'll learn about. And then you measure the intensity of the light at each of these colors, at each of these frequencies. And sometimes you learn at specific frequencies, you have missing light, at others you have extra light, the general shape of the spectrum, more blue, more red, you can get a lot of physical information. From the spectrum, you can extract compositions. You can figure out what that thing's made of, even if it's light years away, millions, billions of light years away. Temperature, you can measure its temperature without actually being there with the thermometer. Uh, more subtle analyses, you can measure the density of gases that you're looking at or looking through, uh, magnetic fields if they're there and their strengths, and motion. You can figure out the objects moving towards you or away from you or turbulently. So there's a lot of great physical information you can extract from the spectrum. So we're going to learn about the nature of light. We're going to learn how to extract this because then it's not just the basics. We'll be able to really get into details of deciphering the universe around us. And then once we have this toolkit, we'll reapply it uh, to the solar system uh, in much greater detail than we have so far. So light will be the primary topic. And in terms of learning things about the universe, astronomers learn most of what we know about the universe from light. All right, something like 99.999% of what we know about the universe comes from light. It's something like that. Yeah, it's not a scientific measurement, but the point is most everything. But I should say we do learn about the universe in other ways as well. And these are more Astro 102 topics, but and maybe I'm plugging Astro 102 a little bit here, but let me mention some of the other ways that we can gain information about the universe. One way is particles, like protons, neutrons, electrons, the stuff we're made of. Sometimes this stuff travels through space too and impacts the Earth, and um, uh, usually they're traveling at high speed, and when they hit their atmosphere, that energy, their, their speed, uh, has an energy associated with it. That energy is converted into new particles. We get a particle cascade that comes down to the earth and we have detectors on the ground that can pick up these cascades and we can work backwards and figure out how energetic that original particle was and which direction it came from. These particles that are created are, call, are called cosmic rays. So these kinds of things can produce cosmic ray showers. They're not light. Cosmic rays are not a type of light. They're just other particles that we can detect on the ground but we can learn a little bit about the universe in that way. Not much, but some. There's another class of particle called a neutrino that tells us a lot about what's going on in the universe. And we're just beginning to use these and, and still trying to understand some of the physics of them. These are chargeless 
very low mass particles and very non-interactive. The sun is producing zillions of them every second. Uh, like between now and now, I think about two trillion of them went through your skull, something like that. But fortunately, they're very non-interactive. They don't touch anything. They go clean through, they go clean through the earth. But we have uh, designed detectors full of different fluids, different types of fluids. If the neutrinos, you know, we have lots and lots of them going through. Every now and then one will interact, producing light. So we line these things with uh, photo sensors and look for that light. Other things can trigger it, so you have to bury these. These are deep, deep down under the earth where nothing can get through except the neutrinos. Again, most just pass through the detector, but occasionally you'll have an interaction. And so we get maybe one or two of these neutrinos per day, most coming from the sun, but also we can get them from supernova explosions if they occur close enough to us. So it's yet another window onto the universe. And the other new window onto the universe, and this is like brand new, is gravitational waves. Neutrinos, we talk a lot about those in Astro 102 and gravitational waves as well. Gravitational waves, this is something Einstein predicted a long time ago. Uh, and for decades, we've been trying to build the technology. And basically what happens is if you have two massive objects spiraling around each other, usually in spiraling, they're getting closer and closer and closer and gonna combine, that will produce ripples in the fabric of space and time itself. We, we think of space as nothing, but Einstein showed it's something and you can shake it and ripple it. Those ripples work their way through the universe and pass through us. And they cause us to stretch kind of like this, this way and then this way and this way and this way, but at a subatomic level, which is why we don't see it. We don't, you know, walking around looking at objects, we don't see them shaking like jello. But uh, in theory, this has been happening at a subatomic level. And we finally, back in 2005, built detectors sensitive enough to pick up these ripples. Um, this is LIGO, one of the two LIGO detectors in the United States. The Europeans have one called Virgo, and the Japanese are building one called Kengra that will come online soon. All of them are down right now for upgrades. And then they all come on and work together. But these tubes are like four kilometers long. There's a laser that goes up and back. And so as these ripples come by here, it makes one arm longer, one arm shorter. And using the lasers, you can detect those small, small changes, subatomic scale changes. And starting 2015, we started detecting like massive black holes merging. And in 2017, you know, with two black holes merging, you just have to trust the gravitational wave data. You can't verify it because black holes don't produce any light. But by 2017, we detected two neutron stars merging, uh, much lower mass. And when they do, they make an, an explosion. And that's one of the research goals of the prompt telescopes is to chase these gravitational wave localizations looking for an optical, a visible light counterpart to confirm um, Einstein's theories here. In 2017, we discovered the first of those using one of the prompt telescopes in Chile, which as soon as COVID's done, um, if it's, or, or abates anyway, uh, that telescope will open up again and you may be able to use it as, you know, for those of you in the lab sequence. Anyway, um, it's a new exciting window onto the universe. So it's not just all light, but it's mostly light. And in lesson three, we will uh, just focus on the light aspects. So let me just mention what we'll talk about next. And that is light, is it a particle? or a wave. And this is a fun topic. Uh, do, well, the answer, I'll give you the answer to the question. The, que the answer to the question is yes. <laughs> it, sometimes it's a particle, sometimes it's a wave. They tend to travel as waves, be detected as particles. Uh, they travel as waves, but as soon as we try to look, it's a particle again. So it's really weird stuff, and this will get us into quantum mechanics and some of the philosophy of nature and existence. But we'll pick up with that next time. So I'll stick around for questions. Otherwise, see you Friday. Thank you. Pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you. I have a question. Um, like, what kind of like videos or like extra work can I do to not necessarily like, get caught up, but just to like kind of do some extra practice because I've never really taken astronomy. And it's not that this stuff is like confusing. It's just like, I don't really know what it's like applicable to or like how to like wrap it together. Like, is there some extra stuff I can do uh, to like improve my understanding? Um, so we have the warm up questions and I'll post all of those before the exam. So you'll be able to go through them again and in more detail. And of course, they're all captured on video and, and you can take screenshots of them as I put them up as well. So they're, they're the warm up questions. They're the homework questions, and um, if you can get through those, you should be well prepared for the exam. The exam questions will look a lot like the homework questions, a lot like the warm-up questions. Uh, the math ones might actually be even simpler on the exam. Some of the yeah. homeworks, I try to make them two-step on the exams, just one step usually. All um, right. Um, when is the exam? It's currently scheduled for a week from Friday, and okay. we'll, we'll see if that's the case if that's still the case when we get through the material. And are you allowed to tell me how long it is? Yeah, it'll be 25 questions, multiple choice. Uh, doesn't mean they're easy, but they will be the same difficulty as the homework questions. And um, you'll have 24 hours to do it. Okay. Well, thank you. Sure. See you Friday. See you Friday. Have a good one. I just have a question for the lab. Um, I asked my TA about it, but he hasn't gotten back to me. And since lab one is due on Friday, um, it's important. Um, in Afterglow, I'm not able to see um, the file information for the images that are taken by the telescopes. Like I can see the advanced data, but yeah, not the we've learned about that. That is a browser thing that will be fixed in the next update that's coming soon. But if you go to the um, there's a switch you can look at the raw information and it's all there under raw. So I checked under raw and like it'll say um, telescope, but there'll just be nothing listed. It'll just be blank. Oh, okay. Let me let me go there and take a look. Or is everything blank under raw? Um so the additional raw data is present, but the basic information is just not there. Okay. If it's causing a problem, you can try it in Chrome. We know it works in okay. Chrome, and it's now been fixed in other browsers. We just haven't pushed it out yet. Okay, so I'll, I'll definitely do that. Yeah, Afterglow 2 is brand new. We did some testing this summer, but now mm -hmm. we're doing it at scale, and so these things kind of come out. Mm -hmm. uh, my password. And I'm using Chrome, so it's probably going to look fine for me. Okay. Under image... Info. So down here under telescope, it's uh, you don't you don't see any of this stuff. See. Then if you go right. here, and then yeah, if I go there, it just is blank. It's blank. Okay. Try it in Chrome. Try it in Chrome. All right, I'll do yeah. that. All right, thank you, Professor. Sure, not a problem. Forgot my question. Uh. Was it, oh, I had a, actually, it was also pertaining to the lab. Um, the picture I got for uh, Hamea or Hamea, I don't, I don't really know how you pronounce it, um, was sort of, it's sort of fuzzy, but I feel like I, like I did it and I was able to pick it out. Is that good enough? Yeah, you won't see any detail on Hamea, uh, but as long as it's there, it, it should be there in kind of typical brightness of other stars in the image. If you want, you can share your screen. I just meant okay. Here, I'll second. pull it up real quick. Yeah, we can take a look together. Sorry, I usually use spacebar to do it. I just unmuted myself. Let me pull it up real quick. Should be. And then I tried taking another picture of it again and uh, resubmitting it, but it, it's, that's not happening right now. Okay. 
Um, it's like this, and I, the general brightness of the stars here. Oh, like, you need to hit your share yeah. button first. I'm getting it in the this. Here it is, right here. Is that is that working? Yep, I'm almost there. It's sharing. And so, yep, okay, I see your screen now. Yep. Is that good enough? Because I I picked it out. I think it was near. Uh, let me see. Near one of the general kite shapes of stars. Okay, yeah, it should be usually should be pretty close to the center, mm -hmm. uh, as as long as the telescope had a no problem pointing. Uh, you're looking at this under Skynet right now. Yeah, should I pull it up under Afterglow? Yeah, pull it up under Afterglow, and we can double check right away. And then there, and then right there. All right, is that working? Yep. Perfect. Okay, so what you're looking at there is the raw image. Yeah. Uh, and then I did I did fiddle with it in the final image. Let me see what I did. But there's a better image you can use. Uh, so in that same directory, go up to your yeah. data providers. Okay. And, and let's find this directory. So it's under user. And then find your Haumea observation. There it is. And go to reduced images. Load that one in. Better? Uh, it, actually, yeah, I can see it yep. a little more. Okay. Now, let's load in the DSS. All right. Yeah. So it's that gear symbol on the upper left. All right, I got that. Do you see? Is this right? Okay. And go ahead and synchronize the two. Like that. Okay, great. And then what I got was, wait, was that? So there's that. And then what I found was, let's see. It will be at the very center of the DSS image, but in your image. So zoom out. So you oh, it was this one. Yeah, that's probably it. Um, looking. Yeah. Uh, yep, yep. That's got to be it. So I'm pretty sure that's what I chose in my final one. Yeah, your image is not the greatest. Uh, do no. you know what telescope it came from? It came from, I, I think it was USASC. Yeah, it was USASC. Okay. Uh, which is usually a good scope, but it may have been bad weather conditions. Mm -hmm. uh, and normally, I, couldn't, I can't resubmit it. Uh, you can if you want, but I think you have it here. Okay. So, yeah, it's the one. Go ahead and point to it again. I'm pretty sure it was this one right here. Yep, it is. You see the Three. one to the left and the one beneath it just barely. Those are the two down below that are diagonal. Yep. yep. And so in the lab, you'll put little markers around common stars in both images and then another marker and label around Haumea. Yeah, I'm pretty sure I already got that part done. I just wanted to make sure because I know this uh, this image was a little funky. Yeah, it's um, good enough. Yeah. Sweet. All right, thank you. Sure, and my then, pleasure. Um, I don't know. Another another fun astronomy question. Uh, sure. How much of the calculus that we use today was actually made by Newton and not derived from other people? Um, today, that was all all Newton. I mean, we barely have uh, skimmed the surface of the the calculus and the mathematics he did. Yeah. yeah. If you watch that video, you'll see a little bit more of it, but we don't even make use of calculus in that video, but it, it's all from the Principia. Okay, that's cool. Well, thank you. Sure.